join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips and much, much more. Only on responsible overlanding. Okay, so we've got quite a bit of space here. So you've got a lot of space. Really, this is aimed at having a kitchen area. You've got your fridge here, so a 60 litre fridge freezer, okay. which is great to have. It's more, any, any it's more about accessibility. No, I'd say if I was looking at a fridge, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at reliability. I think the angles have been fantastic over the years. They're a really bulletproof fridge. I like the National Lunars. Um, it's a very well-built fridge. I get we get very good support. I mean, there are other makes on the on the on the market, Snowmaster and others. So you know, a fridge is what you're gonna if you're gonna use a fridge or a freezer. Make sure you've got good support from the suppliers. Make sure you understand that it's wired in properly because that's often where the problems come in. And understand how to use the fridge, and that's key. So this, this is very neatly tucked away here. Well, what we've done on, on the double cab is you've got the wheel arch that sits inside here. So you've got a little bit of limit where you can put the fridge. I'm not a great fan of putting the fridges high up and also not, I don't really like these brackets that drop them down. They do have a place when people are stuck, stuck and they're trying to fit this in the back of a 80 series, let's say. But when you can utilize the space here, you've got an awning, this becomes your living area. So once you've put your awning up here, you've got access to, a, to your kitchen. You've got storage underneath here. So we've got storage you know, underneath here where we put bags. So that's that's a great place we put wine in there. Nice. Okay. And then we have another bag in front of that and we put the soft drinks. So that can sit out of the way. And then you've got access to, you know, your kitchen. You can make a cup of coffee. Generally we've got I mean, you've got a jet boil there. Is this approaching glamping status to this track? Well, <laughs> Put it this way, you've got something that's really, it's, it is nicely done, so it's accessible. You're using a lot of space, it's costing money to do this. Do you need this? You could put all this in a box, it would work as well. So, so this looks really so good. So it's really nice, it's, it's you know, Clock you, point you spent well. money to do this. You, you know, the jet boil, you can pull a jet boil out. I love the jet boil for making up, for making up a quick cup of coffee. You can access your fridge. You've got a little net in the top here. You've got storage. You can put clothing bags. So everything's got its place. And you've got on the back door, you've, you've got things where you can put. So we make little net pockets and stuff that can you can put things and organize. It really is about organizing the space. And that's the key. And your luggage, would, you, would, the, would that go in? Soft bags. Soft bags. Soft bags, yeah. Soft bags, because soft bags in the back mean when you stop and you're going to go into a BMB, you can take the bags out, you can go into the BMB. Generally, when you take your bags out, you can put them on the front seat, driver seat, and passenger seat, and that's where it needs to sleep for the night. You've got the footwell. You can, you, you've actually, I can go there, change, sort myself out, and not interfere with what's happening in the kitchen or living area. It's a good old-fashioned army good. duffel bag. Yeah, I, I prefer something that's more accessible because you get really nice canvas bags with two pockets on the end, and then it opens up where that you open it up, and then you've got you can see into the top and side of the bag. And then I use uh, lightweight bags that you can put your shirts in one and so you can literally got four or five bags in there and then your bag is not pulling out one thing from the bottom and everything collapses down <laughs> and we've all done it. So I do find if you take a bit of time to organize your clothing, you don't need a huge amount of clothing. You know, go with less clothing. Yeah, you've got to wash it a bit often, but a rinse out for most clothing is good enough to get the dust out. Hang it up and by the morning it's dry if it's the right sort of gear. So take less clothing, and you shouldn't need a bag much more than about this, by this, by this. And then you need some warm gear, and that's where the net in the top here, that works really well. Would you put your jacket in there? So this, this net, so one of two ways, you either have it made like this, or we have a, a fine mesh net. But what it does give you is access to your jackets. So here is dead space. This is very valuable dead space. The same as in the canopy here, this is dead space. That's another reason not to have a seat in the back, to be able to pack No, if you've got a seat in the back and there's two of you and you want to pick up some people, you can just unclip yeah. things. So I mean, if you had four people, that's where the space becomes yeah, an issue. Yeah, it does. And I think, you know, what you're looking at using is you're trying to utilize space where you can pack stuff that you can get to. So if I'm in the car here and it's raining, 
and I'm cold, I can grab a jacket from behind me, I can yeah. put it on, I can get into my rain gear and then get out of, the car. out of the car. And you, you mentioned earlier about the, the key South African and Aussie market, uh, obviously the, the USA market's uh, booming as well. So the USA market is going to take the world by storm because the Americans are very innovative and they create a lot of interesting products. It's going to be interesting to see. They don't have the same um, experience in the sense that you know we've got the African bush and they've got some amazing remote areas to go and explore. So it's a very interesting market and I'm very excited because there's some key people driving that market and there are guys doing some great work there. And it's a, it's a big, you know, it's a big powerful uh, place. And if you think America, when they grab something and move with it, it really, it really gets momentum and goes. So exciting for all of us, you know, I think the collaboration, the interest in products, I've seen some incredibly beautiful products that have been built, you know, even roof tent designs and stuff that have come out which are looking great. We just want to be able to share those products so we'll be able to, again I think products will start flowing from America into Africa into Australia because they'll be built at good value and people will want to share them around the world and people will want them. You know, if you're seeing something that is new and innovative, you're going to look and say, I'd like that. And that happens, you know, I get, we build vehicles for clients and we, we're sourcing parts from around the world because there's items people like. So the world is becoming, it's an easier place, you know. It's like an Amazon. Well, we just need that for our overland parts and it's simple. But it's that easy where people go, you know what, I really would like that part in America or Australia. Let's order it and bring it in. It's doable. It's just a Are question these parts of made in, in the country of origin or is there still the Chinese well, I think, influence? Well, I don't think the Chinese influence is all bad. I think the quality of parts that come out of China, there's some incredible stuff. So don't knock China. There's, there's amazing stuff that comes out of China. The challenge I found with, with people having stuff made in China is they will make it for a price, but they'll also compromise on the quality, and that's your responsibility. I had it many years ago where a guy, he made a roof tent and he took it to China and he cut the price down and cut the price down to the point when it arrived they'd made the tent, but in order for them to make it for that price, they had to cut corners somewhere. You know, it's, it can't, you can't be working for nothing. So that was the sad point. So, you know, if, if the quality, if, if people manage it properly, you can have a lot of very good stuff made in China. It's got a fantastic economy, more than people realize. You just have to drive through that country to appreciate the enormity. So, for my, in my mind, you know, globally people are taking an interest in, in our um, overlanding type of experience. It's, it's becoming more available to people. And that's the exciting part. People want to travel, they want to, they want to challenge themselves, they want to go and explore the world, and they can do it in a four-wheel drive. So, you know, it now gives people an opportunity to go, well, if I take this truck, I can go and explore. How do I do it? Where do I go? What do I do? The world's a small place. People will be building trucks in America, shipping them out to Africa, driving their truck in Africa. The economy of that's not always, always good because it's expensive to ship. And now, equally, I've got people who will buy a truck in, in Africa, keep it here, and that becomes their Africa truck. So you know, are you getting more clients from America? My clients are globally, and I have a good number of clients from America. I do because people have a passion for Africa. That's one thing when you when you look at the world. Africa's quite unique in what it has. It's got amazing wildlife. It's got a fantastically interesting culture. The language universally is English, that you can make yourself understood. So traveling in Africa is not too difficult. It's more understanding the culture, the people. The fear factor is often based on people who don't understand Africa. You know, I'm scared to go to Africa. It's not safe. It's not safe in many parts of the world. Okay? It depends on your approach and how you prepare yourself and, and where you go. And I often challenge people on that and say, you know, it's it's safe when you know how to travel safely and how you take the right attitude with you. So that's important. And there's also a lot of misinformation through the media about Africa. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, people come out and they experience even South Africa. South Africa, you know, I came back to South Africa five years because my, my, my passion and my soul rests very peacefully here in South Africa. And the opportunity to build vehicles for people globally in South Africa is a great opportunity and I believe fantastic because you can build a truck and you can go into Africa and explore and we can prepare them so that they go and go and enjoy this experience and, and come away with a uh, unique memory that they can treasure 
So it doesn't mean to say you can't do it in Australia, you can. There's some fantastic places, and in America. So globally there are places, but it's very easy to do it here. But being situated in, in Cape Town is almost a gateway into Africa, so to speak. So it is, it's absolutely a gateway, and I think that's, that's what I've seen. And it's very easy to get people to come to Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come to Cape Town, come and enjoy yourself for two weeks, and by the way, come and spend some time. And a lot of expertise vehicle. here as well. Yes, there's, you know, there's good expertise. I think the world over there's good people who know what they're doing and, and who offer you know, really good advice based on exp good experience. And I think people that's have important. been out there and done it. Absolutely. And they're people who've done some amazing, amazing, incredible travel. And that's what you want. But there's a balance, you know, to do incredible travel doesn't make you a master of preparing cars if you don't have the background in engineering and mechanics and that because that's important. Exactly. So it's, it's that balance. You've got to understand, you know, what it takes to put a truck together, not just because you've been overlanding. And I think that's that's the important part. So yeah. And you've got to make a few mistakes to learn. You learn <laughs> heaps. I learn heaps and people help me teach me and share with me and I think that's what that's what really is valuable to me is that you know it's a collaboration you can't know it all and you're not going to get it all right. Is that dangerous for when people go out there and think they do know it all? I think it's I think often it can be ignorance or arrogance um, and I think that's that is dangerous I think it's important to understand what are your strengths what are your weaknesses understand your knowledge it's what you don't know that you don't know and you hear me say that often but I think it's very real people don't always know what they don't know and then they land themselves up in a situation and then it can turn pear-shaped and become quite dangerous and and that's that doesn't take much for that to happen especially when you go in remote places and Australia can be very remote and very dangerous as can in parts of Africa so you know these days it is about it really is about understanding um, the safety elements. We have got really good equipment and uh, ability to communicate and be safe. So take that responsibility, especially if you're taking your family or someone with you. Now with 5G coming, you, you're going to be covered <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you know, people say that. You're not covered everywhere. You know, you've got well, to have That's probably masks, a good thing. You don't you know? want to have cell phone radiation well, you everywhere. Well, you don't want cell phones everywhere. But, you know, even Namibia, which is a pretty well standard country, there are a lot of areas in Namibia where you can't get cell phone reception. So I always say, carry a satellite phone. A satellite phone has huge value. You only need to have to use it once, and you'll, you'll never regret carrying it. I will never go on an expedition without a sat phone. You know, there were days and years when we, they weren't available. They're available. Take them. You know, I'm standing here today because a sat phone worked in my car that I wrote off, and I was able to get help and it was my passenger who was using the sat phone. So, you know, sat phones, don't even debate it. I'd sooner leave something else behind and make sure I've got a sat phone, because you can rent them, you don't have to buy them. You can buy them second hand, not an excuse. And do you use the, the, the boosters, the, the mobile um, reception boosters that you, mm. you see sometimes? It's not often that people fit them. I've had a few clients fit them. You know, you can get a, a cell phone mobile booster, great to have. Uh, again, it's quite an expensive you know, add-on and you can get some very nice gadgets, but you need to have a need for that. You know, you can get away with having a, a mobile phone. I normally would recommend that people take their mobile phone with their, their normal in-country SIM card in it. So that's the one you use at home. And then I would take a second phone, a smartphone, and I'd put a SIM card in it locally and use that. And if you wanted a couple of you, you could carry a small router and you could put a local data card in there. So that on the cell networks will give you what you need and then carry a sat phone. And then if you want to be extra careful, you can take something like a, a spot device or an EPIRB where you can, the spot I do like, the spot, it's a small device, um, it's very well managed and it really is a good product. You can push a button which will send emails to five or six people you've designated to say, hey, I'm okay. And when you open that link up, it shows me on Google Earth where you where you pressed the button. Or well, I presume there's another button saying, "Come pick me up." <laughs> <laughs> there's exactly that. So you know, and and that that's true. So you've got that. You've got that peace of mind. And for a lot of people traveling, it's letting the people know at home you're okay. Exactly. You know, when we all, when we drove Canning stock route, I remember, and there were a few burnt out vehicles along the way. Yeah. So you know, you get that. But on Canning, the only way we could let our friends and family know at home excuse me, that we were okay, 
every night at a set preset time, we sent a message on the on the sat phone. We didn't phone; we just sent a message where we were, and we were okay. And everyone can relax. They don't need to know the details. They need to know you're okay. So for a lot of parents, they worry about their kids going. Yeah. You know, so make it safe. Make it safe. Make it simple. I'll make it fun. <laughs>